Hi everyone, my name is Hai Zhu. I am an associate professor in the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. It is my great pleasure today to speak here and to introduce some of our recent studies and findings. I guess it is on. Okay, so human beings are inherently social animals. Our lives depend on other humans. And we, as humans, we form social systems like groups, communities, organizations. Every day, we connect, communicate, exchange, and work with each other in social systems. In the past six decades, the computing technologies have fundamentally changed how we interact with each other in social systems. I do research in human-computer interaction and social computing. At a high level, I study how the computing technologies and our groups, communities, organizations, and societies are co-evolving and transforming each other in the process. In any groups, community, or organizations, the abilities to understand the socially relevant human behavior is critical to the success of any of these social systems. For example, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, two people have to understand each other's intent behaviors in order to coordinate the conversation content process. In specific conversational contexts like therapy sessions, and the uh, counselor have to understand the patient's intent behavior, even predict their future behavior in order to apply corresponding clinical micro skills or interventions. In classrooms, the teachers have to understand their students' behaviors in order to design and conduct educational activities. In online communities like Reddit and Wikipedia, moderators try to figure out the intent of the content contrib contributors to make moderation decisions. In criminal justice systems, uh, the judges have to decide the amount of bail by weighing the risk of the defendants fleeing and not appearing for trials. For thousands of years, we as human beings have de developed our skills, expertise, procedures, methods to understand and predict each other's socially relevant behaviors. And oftentimes, we use this understandings and predictions to make important social decisions. For example, the counselor have to decide whether they want to transfer their patient to suicidal hotline. Uh, teachers have to decide whether they should intervene to help the students or let the student explore on their own. Or the content moderators decide whether they should delete the content, remove the account. Oh, sorry. And the uh, judges decide whether they should detain or release the defendants. Things changed in the, oh, uh, in the past decade. The field of artificial intelligence, AI, have seen striking development. And suddenly, we have seen that the AI-based tools, they might be under the name of intelligent tools, risk assessment tool, data-driven predictive tools, and they are quickly spreading across a growing range of social decision-making contexts. And for example, we have seen that the increasing use of intelligent tools in digital mental health support Classrooms all over the world have started to adopt the intelligent learning software. Moderators rely on intelligent tools to moderate content. Machine learning-based risk assessment tools are increasingly used in criminal justice and child welfare systems. And these AI tools come in and trying to achieve the goal of augmenting our understanding of the socially relevant human behaviors and support the decision making. However, unlike non-social tasks, and the ground truth in a lot of these social decision-making tasks is that these, uh, the ground truths are actually socially contested and inherently uncertain. And for example, whether there is uh, actual child abuse or neglect in a referral cases, whether the content is toxic or not, whether the patient is suicidal or not, they are often inherently uncertain due to the complexity of human behavior and the complexity of the social circumstances. And human decision makers have already learned how to operate on the nuance and the unstructured knowledge, incorporate subjective and potentially uh, like contested values into this high impact and high stake decision making. But it is unknown how the AI tools are doing in some of these uh, social decision making context uh, tasks in real world. So this question actually yeah, motivates like, uh, some of my recent work. So the first question I want to answer is, how are these AI tools actually doing in the real world social decision making context? How are they used? How good are they? Can they actually complement and augment our human decision making? 
And second question is, that how can we design, deploy, and evaluate innovative AI tools that can better support social decision making? So in today's talk, I'm going to share some of our recent uh, progress and findings. And I'm going to, this, uh, my talk will be like two parts. And in the first part, I'm going to share our recent study, which is a mixed method post-deployment analysis of the use of a child maltreatment predictive algorithm used in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. In the second part of my talk, I will discuss some of our ongoing work on developing new design methods, approaches, and tools to help practitioners, researchers, communities to create more successful AI innovations in social systems. Uh, the studies I present today are all collaboration work with the many of my PhD students, undergraduate students, master students, as well as the faculty collaborators. None of the work is possible without the dedication of the students and input from the faculty collaborators. And our work is also sponsored by National Science Foundation, uh, Amazon, Facebook, Toyota, and the CMU Block Center. So now I'm going to first discuss our study on the use of the child maltreatment predictive algorithm in Allegheny County. So uh, because we have limited time today, I will only present the highlights of the finding. And the detailed findings will be included, uh, are included in these two papers recently published at CHI 2022. So if you are interested in learning more details, you can scan the QR code and find the paper. So first, uh, so in this study, we look at the, uh, a real-world context, social work, where AI-assistant decision-making tools are relatively under-discussed, yet rapidly spreading. And this is a map from ACRU in 2021, shows how the new algorithmic tools in social work are beginning to spread across the country. And we can look at the states that are colored green and yellow. The green states are the ones that are currently using or moving towards using this kind of algorithmic uh, machine learning based tools. And the yellow states are ones that have tried but may decide not to use the tool. And in fact, most of these tools that are either currently using, uh, being used or like uh, tried out are inspired by a single tool that was first deployed in Allegheny County, where Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University is. And it is called Allegheny Family Screening Tool, tool or AFST. Uh, this is the tool that we are studying uh, in this project. So Allegheny County's Department of Human Service deployed this uh, AFST in 2016, and the AFST tool assists the social workers in making screening decisions about the potential child maltreatment cases. The tool was trained on large amounts of government administrative data, and the AFST outputs a prediction on a scale of 1 to 20 that is meant to capture the future risk of the children. And specifically, it is designed to predict the future home removal or future re-referral. And the score is categorized virtually into three beings. Uh, the low risk score like from 1 to 9, and the medium risk for score 1 to uh, 14, and high risk is a score, a score that is 15 or above. And the AFST is one of the earliest, uh, most well-known, and the longest deployed AI assistant decision tool in child welfare. And other public sector agencies have looked at AFST as a model of what the AI assisted decision making can or should look like uh, in child welfare. So that's why we think it's critical to study AFST um, and now, because we, we are thinking that we have a window of opportunity maybe to redirect the trajectory. And this is a, a like rough timeline of how FST was developed. And actually, the county started to collect data of individuals who received the service since 24 years ago in 1998. And since then, the agency has started using the data to make informed decisions, often that time starting by manually searching the data. In 2016, the Allegheny County Agency uh, worked with a few researchers coming from backgrounds of economic social work to de develop and deploy this tool, FST. And we, as a group of HCI researchers, were brought in, in a, uh, around like 2021, and we conducted this post-deployment analysis of FST after FST was deployed for over five years. And we come in with two questions. So first, how do social workers decide whether, when, and how much 
to rely upon the FST recommendation. And the second question is, what are the decision quality? Here we measure the quality by the accurate, looking at the accuracy and the racial disparity of the FST recommendations. To answer these questions, we conducted mixed methods uh, research. In order to understand workers' daily experience working with the FST, we visited the call screeners and the supervisors in their actual workplace, and we conducted contextual inquiry and interviews. We shadowed them as they took calls, compiled case, uh, case reports, ran the FST, and make screening recommendations. As they worked, we will occasionally ask questions to better understand their thought process. And uh, after the observation, we conducted a semi-structured post-interview. We revisited moments we observed during the contextual inquiry and probed deeper into their underlying beliefs and practices with using the, uh, with using the tool. And in total, we conducted two full-day field visits over the course of two weeks. We analyzed data from nine call screeners and four supervisors, including 37.5 uh, uh, hours of observation and interviews with 92 pages of observation notes and 9.5 hours of audio recordings. And for the quantitative data analysis, we collected data of the call screening decisions from 2016 to 2018. And we focus our analysis on the black-white disparity since these two are the primary race among the referral cases. And each entry in our data represents a unique child in a unique referral. Now I'm going to uh, share our findings, starting with the qualitative finding. And specifically, we identify three high-level themes in our qualitative analysis. Each capture a key factor that guides workers' reliance on the FST recommendations. Specifically, we found that the workers' reliance of FST is guided by the perception of the model capabilities and limitation, the organizational pressure and the incentives, and also the misalignment between the algorithmic prediction and their own decision-making objectives. In the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through uh, like each of these themes, starting from the first one. So first, we found that the workers form their beliefs and the perceptions of FST's capabilities and the, uh, limitations relatively to their own abilities. Note that workers in Allegheny County, actually they are intentionally given minimal information about how the FST model works. Uh, according to the agency leadership, they told us that they basically just want to discourage any gaming behavior. However, uh, the workers, because they lack the like formal training, and they tend to come up with strategy on their own to learn about the model. And for example, they actually play this guessing game with their colleagues, where they would gamble on what the risk score might be. Over time, they play this guessing games with their colleagues and to see like how far off they were, and the workers actually hone their abilities to predict the scores. And through these like, informal learning strategies, and the worker build up their own sophisticated yet imperfect beliefs and intuitions about the model's behaviors. And the worker use these beliefs and the uh, perceptions to calibrate their reliance on the algorithmic recommendation. And specifically, the worker mentioned that they intentionally adjusted for FST limitations by correcting for the systematic biases in data and reporting. For example, one worker mentioned that if you are poor and you are on welfare, you are going to uh, score higher than a comparable family who has private insurance. So they actually take this in, uh, consideration into their decision making. And second, we also found that the workers' reliance on the algorithm were influenced by the organizational pressure and the incentive structure around the FST. While human reliance is often discussed in the literature as a matter of trust in AI, but our work is the first work to, first work to show that the importance of considering the organizational context in which the algorithm is deployed. And for example, the workers talk about how their organizations are monitoring their performance measures and assessing how frequently they disagree with the high algorithmic risk scores. Some describe that they sometimes agree with a high risk score against their best judgment of, uh, in order to avoid being perceived as disagreeing with AFST too often. And people describe that they felt that they, their expertise as human decision makers were undervalued given the decision protocol that actually discourages the disagreement with the algorithmic scores. 
And finally, workers pointed out that there are fundamental misalignment between the algorithmic prediction and their own decision-making objectives. And actually, the workers, what they are trying to do is to assess the immediate safety concern. But the predictive tools are trying to predict the long-term risk. They're trained to predict like the long-term like home removal risk and the long-term re-referral. So these qualitative findings showed like how, whether and how much and the people like rely upon FST recommendation and when they decided to override the FST recommendation. The next question we ask is, what are the decision quality of the FST recommendation? And note that in Allegheny County, the FST algorithm only provides recommendations to the social workers, to the core screeners and their supervisors. And uh, it is the like, human workers who are making the final decision. So therefore, when we evaluate uh, the, uh, the performance, we study the decision quality of both the FST only and the worker FST decision. Here, FS only decision as a hypothetical decision policy that automatically screen all the high risk cases and screen out all the moderate and the low risk cases. This is a case that to simulate what if the workers basically blindly follow all the FSC recommendation. And then we also compare that with a worker FSC decision made by the co-workers after reviewing the algorithm recommendations, which is a real, uh, uh, real decision. And we evaluate the decision uh, against two metrics, and the screening rate and the accuracy. And we look at the screening rate disparity by looking at how different the screening, dis uh, sc the screening rate is for black and white children um, between the FSD only and the worker FSD decisions. And we also measure the accuracy. Note that we measure accuracy based on the proxies that the FSD is trained to predict, which is a future re referral and out of home placement. Uh, this is a reminder of the, the data set we use. This is the two-year cost screening data. Our data set uh, contains over uh, 51,000 entries on over 33,000 children. Uh, this is our uh, overview of our quantitative finding. On the left, what you can see is the screening rate. We look at the screening rate of the FST-only decision and the worker FST decisions for black children and for white children. And we compute the disparity by looking at the difference. On the right, we see the accuracy. Similarly, we look at the accuracy of the FST only and the worker FST. And we look at uh, the, um, the accuracy for the black children, or white children, and compute the disparity. So our first finding is that the FST only decision would have been more racially disparate than the worker FST decision. From 2016 to 2018, the FST only disparity was 20% because FST only on its own would have investigated 71% of the black children and 51% of the uh, white children. Over the same time period and same set of cases, the workers, the worker disparity was actually 9%. So the workers actually using the algorithm reduced the disparity in the algorithmic recommendation. We want to emphasize that we don't say that the disparity indicates systematic racism or whether they are actually justified. Actually, there is a, 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 a big body of literature in social work talks about how to interpret the disparity. But we still want to uh, emphasize that we believe the disparity, especially the disparity in the screening rate, is important because it indicates an uneven level of state interventions into the white and the black children, as well as the uneven distribution distribution of the potential benefits and harms of interventions. And we also look at the disparity in the accuracy, and we found that the FST was also more racially disparate in terms of accuracy, and the workers actually use FST to reduce the disparity. So we see that workers reduce the racial disparity in the final decision by disagreeing and overriding the AFST recommendations. But note that, remember, in the quality finding, we found that the workers adjusted for FST limitations by intentionally doing like these corrections. So this finding is actually aligned with our quality finding. But also note that our, these social workers, they made these overriding decisions under the authorization pressure. 
remember that the organization actually they are monitoring how often the workers actually disagree uh, with the algorithm. Even sometimes the workers disagree with the high-risk score, like against their best judgment to avoid being perceived as disagreeing too much. So their abilities to override uh, these algorithm decisions actually was constrained. So next, when we look at, uh, just look at the accuracy, overall accuracy, we found that the FST only screening uh, decisions were more accurate than the FST workers, worker decision, especially for the white children. However, we also want to highlight the uh, qualitative finding. Uh, our qualitative findings uh, suggest that the workers point out there is fundamental misalignment between the algorithmic prediction and their own decision-making objectives. So note that the accuracy analysis are based on these outcomes that are like a FST is trained to predict. So for these outcomes, indeed, the FST is more accurate than human, but actually human sometimes disagree with the prediction targets of FST. So um, after we, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, after actually our, uh, our paper was accepted and we received additional data, new data and pre-processing instructions and we reran re all of our quantitative analysis, we actually put up a full description of the new analysis on archive. So this is the extended QR code if you are interested. So uh, the main finding remain consistent and robust to the changes in the data and the pre-processing. For example, we found that the FST only decisions were still more disparate than the worker FST decisions. Here is a, a summary of this finding. So in this finding, we conducted a first in-depth mixed method investigation of workers' current practices and challenges in working with FST. Overall, we found that although FST has been used for nearly half a decade, the system remained a source of tension for many workers. And as it exists right now, we believe FST still is a missed opportunity to effectively complement frontline workers' decision-making abilities. Specifically, there is a misalignment between the system goals and the workers' objectives and values. And there is a lack of formal training and real-time interface support to help the frontline workers to understand and work with the FST recommendations. There is a lack of organizational support to empower the workers to override the erroneous and biased FST recommendations. So know that, yeah, we were brought in like just 2021. So we noticed that there are these limitation of the FST. And if we could go back in time, what we could do, how we can do in order to make it right, and this leads to the second part of my talk, and which is some of our ongoing work of developing new design methods, approaches, and tools to help practitioners, researchers, communities to create more successful innovations and maybe make the FST or FST similar like tools to be more successful. Now here I'm going to present three studies that actually focus on addressing the value misalignment. In the FST case, we see misalignment between the system goal and the workers' objectives and values. But we also find that this is not an isolated case. This is not just open, uh, like um, uh, this is not just a problem with FST. An interview study with 27 public sector machine learning practitioners across 500 countries actually uh, shows that there is a, like a sh general pattern of a disconnect of the design of an existing machine learning system and the community stakeholders' values, realities and context. So today I'm going to discuss maybe briefly these three papers. And these papers are all like uh, aimed at uh, like address the value mis misalignment. Uh, these are the work we published at the CHI 2020, this 2021, and FACT this year, 2022. So uh, in the paper we're publishing uh, at CCW 2018, we propose a bottom-up design method that we call the value-sensitive algorithm design to address value uh, misalignment. We, uh, we propose that we should start by conceptualizing the community stakeholders' value and then use that understanding to guide the design choices of algorithms. 
So the first step is to understand the stakeholder value and then explain the value trade-off, make the trade-off inter interpretable. And third step is to navigate the value trade-off and make design, uh, and, uh, design decisions. And we apply this method in the context of Wikipedia. We all know what Wikipedia is. It is the largest online free encyclopedia. And uh, actually, the quality control is one of the major tasks faced by the Wikipedia community. For example, for English Wikipedia alone, every day they receive over 160,000 edits, and they all immediately go live. So Wikipedia are facing the challenges to like, monitor this large volume of, of incoming edits. So Wikipedia has developed this system called Objective Revision Evaluation System, or ORUS. And ORUS is a machine learning-based predictive tool, and they are designed to predict the edit quality, like whether this given edit is damaging or not, and the editor intent, whether this editor, this contributor, is good face or bad face. Uh, these predictions uh, is, uh, have already been, uh, ORS predictions have already been incorporated in the recent changes on the main Wikipedia interface. And Hugo, which is a content moderation tool used by many reviewers of Wikipedia, like uh, content portrayers of Wikipedia. And they are also incorporated in more than 30 different applications. In our study, we're trying to apply the value-sensitive algorithm design to redesign the Wikipedia's aura system. So first, we're trying to understand the Wikipedia stakeholder's value, and then we explain and design system, interactive system, to explain and visualize the value trade-off. And the third step, we engage community members in the discussion and deliberation of the value trade-off and make a decision. So for the, for the first step, we yeah, conduct interviews to understand the Wikipedia stakeholders' values. We interviewed 16 relevant stake, uh, Wikipedia stakeholders. They are ORS creator to tool developers who created tools based on the ORS predictions. And the four members from the Wikimedia product team, seven regular editors, and two researchers who study Wikipedia, we ask questions like, yes? How come the users of Wikipedia are not part of the community of stakeholders? Yes, that's a very good point. Yes. So in this study, we didn't directly interview users because a lot of users, they might not like understand what is actually going on like in the editing. But also note that most of these people, they hold like dual roles. And these are people they are doing uh, working uh, to contribute content to Wikipedia. They're also consuming the content like everyone here. Yeah, we are like consuming content. So, but you're right, we did not explicitly like interview people who are only the readers of the Wikipedia. Any other questions? Okay, so the, then the questions we ask people are like their roles on Wikipedia, their experience related to ORS, where they are using, like building tools for ORS, or they are impacted by ORS. We ask their opinions and also ideas for future. We conducted a grounded theory method approach. We analyze and code every line of interview transcripts, conduct uh, like group meetings to cross the codes, discuss and iterate, iterate on the themes. And we identify seven themes, uh, seven like values from our qualitative analysis. There are two creator values and five convergent community values. Again, because we have limited time, so uh, this is the list of the convergent community value, and I'm going to highlight the two values. One is the effort reduction, and the other one is the pos uh, positive engagement. The effort reduction is about reducing the effort of community maintenance. And people told that it's really important for communities to like, save the, like, the maintenance effort. For example, one developer told us that uh, if we can leverage the manpower that we do have, with more automation, these people will have less backlog and can focus on other contributions. Another important value is positive engage engagement, which is about encouraging positive engagement with diverse editor groups. For example, one researcher told us that I think the article quality is driven to a large extent by the diversity of the hundreds of users. 
And um, one uh, Wikimedia Foundation employee actually told us that the current ecosystem of Wikipedia limits the diversity of the contributors. So the ecosystem needs to change in order to be more welcoming to certain kinds of people. However, when we're trying to map these community values into the actual system criteria, and we found like that these are like trade-off, inherent trade-off. For example, if we want to like uh, aim at like maximizing effort reduction, then the system criteria, corresponding system criteria, including like we want to maximize the overall accuracy, we want to minimize the false negative rate. In contrast, if we want to like aim at like pr promoting the positive engagement with the diverse editor groups, then we should try to minimize the false positive rate and also make sure to minimize, minimize the disparity between the model performance on the different editor groups. Now, however, these criteria are not compatible. You cannot like simultaneously like achieve all these criteria. And there is like an inherent trade-off between these uh, system criteria. So for the second step, we design uh, interactive variation system to explain and visualize this value trade-off. Uh, we create this tool called Aorus Explorer, uh, which contains a set of visualizations to help application designers and community members to understand the inherent trade-offs in Wikipedia Aorus system. So our um, uh, system contains multiple interfaces. The first one is a landing page, where we provide the basic overview of the Aura system, how the Aura scores uh, like works, and how the Aura is making predictions. And we also explain some of the fundamental uh, machine learning concepts and how that like uh, correspond and represent different community values. And we, in this way, our users will have the necessary knowledge to explore the variations that comes next step. And we create this interface called Threshold Explorer. And this interface allowed people to explore different threshold setting and the inherent trade-off associated with setting different thresholds. So for example, if the threshold is set to 0.5, any edits with scores above 0.5 will be predicted as damaging. And this uh, Explorer interface allows users to play with the threshold setting. And we also have this group disparity visualizer, which allows uh, users to see and compare the model performance on the different groups and for the different models with different thresholds and in terms of the looking at or uh, compare different uh, evaluation metrics. And we also have this threshold recommender interface. Here, we allow the users to just choose their goals and the preferences. And then we automatically like, recommend the threshold according to their preferences and goals. And but we also allow users to adjust the, uh, like, adjust the threshold and continue to play based on the recommended threshold. Yeah. In the previous interface, what are the different groups that they see yeah, very good question. So here we are probably looking at the anonymous editor group and the identified editor group. And uh, we, uh, for the identified editor group, we all, people can also look into like a newcomers and experienced editors. Because there are already literature uh, uh, looking at studying you know, Wikipedia and found that there are like a systematic bias against the, like a newcomers. Sometimes the newcomers, they are like, uh, their edits are much more easily to be reverted and marked as damaging compared to experienced editor. And so are the anonymous editors. So here we want to like look at actually the, um, uh, the disparity across uh, anonymous newcomers and experienced uh, editors. We also want to look at other attributes, for example, demographic information, uh, male, female, for example, of the editors. We also know that there is a huge gender gap in the editor base and have a systematic uh, uh, on gender. However, we don't have data that uh, about people's gender. Because Does Wikimedia not collect that? Yes, Wikimedia does not collect so people's gender. Right, 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 right. But in some of the previous like surveys, people posted, researchers posted, they found that over ninety percent of editors are male, ten percent of the editors less than ten percent of editors are female. But yeah, Wikipedia because Wikipedia does not collect demographic data, so we don't have the demographic All data. Our research showing how bad the diversity of Wikipedia, Wikipedians, or whatever you call them, is has not led to any change. Like yeah, it doesn't lead to any changes in their practice. And they do have the concern, maybe like also the privacy 
of the people. And yeah, but yeah, the, the short answer is that didn't change the uh, data collection. Okay, so. Yeah, so uh, we, we did some uh, evaluation with this like uh, interactive system and found that these systems could be, uh, are very effective in helping people who do not have machine learning backgrounds to understand the inherent, inherent trade-offs in uh, our system. And then in the third step, we uh, present these systems to the community members and engage the community members in the discussion of these value trade-offs. So we combine the visualizations with the community deliberation workshops. And the goal is to explain the tensions, value tensions, to the community members and engage them to resolve the tensions between the uh, different uh, community values. We conducted our workshops in two uh, Wikipedia language community, uh, one Dutch community and uh, the English, Wikipedia, uh, English Wikipedia community. Um, we design our deliberation protocol like this. So first, uh, the participant have to uh, like complete a pre-survey, and then the participant will individually explore the Oris Explorer interface, pick a model, and they can export a model card. And um, after this individual uh, exploration phase, we in, uh, uh, we put the people together and ask people to conduct a, uh, and to, to start a discussion. Then they can discuss like the uh, the, uh, the models different individuals picked and discuss the pros and cons of the different models and what is the best for the community. They can also go back to the Oris Explorer interface and to find a different model. And uh, after that, we ask our participant to write a proposal. They need to either pick a model or they can say that oh we don't want any model uh, after that we uh, like complete a, a post survey so this is the interface we developed to further facilitate the group deliberation. And here we allow uh, users on the basis of the ORIS um, basic interface, we also create this model card author, uh, authoring interface. And uh, people can export, uh, uh, export any model and um, generate a model card which has a like, concise summary of the model performance and how that impacts the different uh, community stakeholders. So in the summary, uh, this series of work we believe contribute to the HCI uh, and AI communities, and we believe that our study contribute first a broad understanding of the human values related to the AI-based predictive tools in online communities. We also uh, design this like novel approaches and, and uh, supporting toolkits that can facilitate greater community control and agency, and leads to the creation of AI tools that are more aligned with the community values. And this work has direct implications uh, on the improvement of Wikipedia Aorus, as well as a broader implication on the design of AI tools in other on, uh, on, online or offline community contexts. So now I'm going to use the final few slides to share some of our ongoing work that are happening in my lab at a high level. And we conduct a, like a, both a discovery type of work, trying to understand the impact of AI tools, how people use these AI tools and in social systems. We also conduct design type of work, uh, trying to create uh, like a new methods, approaches, and toolkits. And specifically, we conduct research in multiple domains. And one of the important domains we uh, will look at is the online uh, mental health support. And people with mental health problems are increasingly turning to online peer support communities for help instead of professional services. And because this peer support service is much cheaper and more accessible, we actually partner with 7cups.com, which is one of the largest uh, online peer-to-peer -peer mental health support community in the world. And we started the use and design of various AI tools in this context, such as aggressive matching system, the suicidal prediction system, and the chatbot-based training environment. And to, uh, the goal is to create a better peer support environment. And my student, Anna Fang, uh, Logan Staple, uh, Stapleton, and Wenjie Yang are working in this domain. I also studied Git work, Git platforms, and the whole Git economy ecosystem, uh, focusing on designing intelligent decision support tools to empower and enhance Git workers. And this is a part of a larger NSF project involving four different institutions. My uh, student Jane is working actively in this direction. 
And beyond the FST and the decision support tools in child welfare, we also worked on the AI using housing services and building services in Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh. And we also continue to work on like our online content moderation and in the Wikipedia context. And my student Ye yeah, Shen is working on this. And we have the uh, intelligent learning software in classroom. Uh, we are also starting intelligent learning software in classroom. And my student Naomi is really interested in understanding how these tools are actually used in classroom, especially for students with different types of learning disabilities. We as a lab also believe that not every problem in social system could be or should be resolved by AI. So we are also exploring a lot of non-AI based solutions. And for example, my student Jordan and Suya are interested in looking at the online infrastructure, data infrastructure. Uh, for example, Jordan used the infrastructure lens to study the social media use for marginalized groups. And we're also exploring low-tech and no-tech innovations in the context of child welfare. And Logan has started, uh, conducted this interesting like, community workshop to explore a lot of like, low-tech and no-tech alternatives. And uh, Anna is working on developing like, new deliberation process and protocol around whether or not the design and the use of a public sector AI tool is justified. And Jay is working on like uh, using like speed dating as a method to explore the wide space of service and policy innovations to promote the gig worker well-being. So this is, uh, I believe, all the slides I have. And thank you, uh, everyone, and for yeah listening to my talk. And now I'm happy to take any question. Um, I'm curious, especially on when you were looking at sort of the child risk assessment, how was the model looking at the kind of relative failure of classifying someone at risk when they weren't at risk versus not classifying them at risk when they were at risk? Because it seems like those failures aren't necessarily equal in terms of potential impact. So I'm curious whether or not there's any analysis of if, for example, the human workers had higher failure rates in one area than the machine in the other area. Um, yeah, 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 that's a very good question. So, uh, yeah, you are completely right. So different kind of errors actually have a different kind of impact. And both like errors, like is, is a false positive or false negative, has very like important uh, societal consequences. So in the current analysis I, I present, we didn't explicitly explore. We look at the overall accuracy. But some of uh, like work conducted by also PhD students in HCI, like look, uh, uh, and he He's trying to look at like what kinds of the errors that the FSC is making and what kind of error like the human is making, and then trying to see that if there is a pattern and as a way to see what we could do to better like complement the like the human like abilities and the machine learning capabilities. So that's a great question. That's also some area that we are exploring. Thank you, Kai, for the breakup. Uh, so I have some questions regarding your first study about AFSD. So I remember you mentioned like uh, one interesting point that these social workers, sometimes their objectives are different from the, the tool's objective. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate more on that, like what kind of difference did you observe? And because you also built uh, new approaches and tools to address these problems, do you have any thoughts about what kind of tool or novel design approaches can be used to. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So let me uh, pull up the slides. And uh, what we found basically is, yeah, the, the workers, they are trying to assess the immediate safety concerns. So they will focus on the case itself, looking at the allegations and trying to figure out whether this particular kid is in any immediate risk and safety like risks. But the tool, what it does, it basically train on historical data. And it's actually predicting the future risk. So there is this misalignment between this. And then a lot of workers, sometimes they override the 
tool because they believe that, oh, this kid is not in immediate like risk, although it's flagged as high risk by the uh, by FST. So what we see uh, to address this issue is uh, uh, this is something uh, uh, my student Anna is interested in doing, and she's trying to maybe uh, one of the things she's trying to explore is how we can co-design a uh, uh, co-design with uh, uh, frontline workers of what is the right thing to predict. So what is the right prediction target? And so we believe that if we could do that, and then that will like address this like a misalignment between the like prediction targets and the actual like the work objectives. Um, thanks so much. Uh, again, on the, um, the the first part, the Allegheny County uh, system. Um, given that it's being employed or being looked at in so many different areas, um, and given that uh, the the data shows that there is this sort of misalignment and there is this disparity in it, um, what do you think is sort of the next step for the tool? I mean, do should should institutions scrap it completely? Should they rework it? Should they rework how it's being implemented or being supported by the institution? I'm, I'm curious, like how how you see um, the the development of it in the future, given what you know now about it. Yeah, yeah. it's a great question. I have a lot to say. <laughs> But actually, some of the things maybe I cannot say here. I'm happy to share with you offline. Happy to share with people. There are a lot of interesting story. Uh, actually, some interesting follow up with uh, FST. But I will say that yeah, our FST work was uh, picked up and reported by a lot of uh, like media, uh, like uh, the journalists, and they got like uh, covered um, in different media articles. And uh, actually, Oregon State and they use a tool that actually models the uh, uh, FST. And after seeing the uh, like media coverage and also yeah, our uh, research papers, they decide to drop their tool. And they are actually exploring like a, a different alternative uh, process uh, to improve the cost screening instead of relying on like uh, automatic tools. And we present our like design like recommendations to Allegheny County, including the uh, changes and uh, in the model itself, the interface and training, as well as the organization uh, potential organizational like uh, changes. But yeah, <laughs> it's there are some interesting story behind it. Uh, yeah, and happy to share more <laughs> offline, maybe. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think in both parts of your talk, I felt like I kind of saw this thread that I was picking up on. So like in the first part, you were talking about how with um, FST, like a lot of the workers were basically assessing how well um, this uh, prediction system was working. And then even with the, the ORES um, part, um, there were, um, I guess, users or editors, they were um, trying to basically translate their own ideas into like what models would look like. And I feel like in both of these um, parts, it's really feeling like we as people have to kind of learn about machine learning more. And it doesn't seem like it's really like um, people who are developing these systems are actually learning about what works best. So are there like, do you know of any people that have kind of done work and like from like, I guess more of like the AI side trying to be like, from the beginning, not just after like this analysis, what are we going to actually build in or think about in terms of like, um, thinking about how people are going to use these systems. Right, that's a great, great question. So we propose that we should actually, the, all the like tool and these algorithm developers should like talk to the stakeholders and learn about stakeholders and then learn, learn about their needs and their, uh, their objectives, their values in the very beginning and incorporate that in the design process. So for the second part, so we are proposing actually the our, 
what we are working with the Wikipedia and the Aorus, like the Aorus creator, actually to redesign uh, the Aorus. So we are applying this approach, like starting with understanding all the stakeholders' values and then trying to figure out how this value map to the different system criteria and then navigate the trade-off and then eventually allow the community members and then the application developers to make informed decisions on like which model uh, the community should use and which model their application should use. So this is the approach that we want to maybe advocate that all the system developers should use. So they should use actually the very basic human-centered design <laughs> to uh, in the in, in the design and the creation of any AI system, especially these AI systems that are deployed in complicated uh, complicated social context, and will it have like this like uh, a lot of impact on people. So uh, this is what we want to argue for, and then yeah, uh, and to what extent like the practitioners will be uh, actually influenced and use this approach, we don't know. We are trying maybe dis disseminate our work, but on the other hand, on we see that on industry end, they are also concerned about uh, like ethics, faith related issues. We have seen some in, uh, very interesting initiatives also coming from industry, like coming from Microsoft, uh, coming from Google, etc. So we do think that there is a shared interest uh, both from academia and the in industry to improve the uh, process of creating AI tools. Um, yeah, I guess I was wondering, like it seemed like um, with the comparison of the just AFST alone versus with worker assistance, it seems like the core thing getting pulled out there is like the importance of this discretion that, that these workers are ta taking. I was wondering like, because um, I was wondering whether the disparity like was a good thing or a bad thing and like given that we don't know what the base rates of like occurrence are. and. Sorry, this is sort of long-winded, but I guess I was just wondering how you, what you think about how we should think about discretion and whether it's going in a good or bad direction. Because um, it seemed like part of the work on the, um, where you're highlighting the misalignment of metrics was working or um, I guess pushing for a direction of maybe like going and measuring that new thing that is aligned with the workers' um, goals. But do you think that there will always be some amount of discretion that is not able to be measured? And, um, yeah, I guess, <laughs> what do you think about how we should reason about that? So, so you are talking about the disparity or you are talking about the, this, um, the difference between the prediction targets and the actual human object? Uh, I think well, I was kind of talking a bit about both. I, okay. With the disparity, I guess it highlighted the fact that there is an important sway in, in workers having that discretion and then mm -hmm. for the misalignment, mm -hmm. um, basically like I think that ties into the discussion as well because like ideally they would be able to um, build off of their perception of what should be mm -hmm. in the model. But do you think we should just build models that mimic the person's discretion, or mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess what do you think about that balance? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. So first of all, about the disparity between the different racial groups. So uh, actually we also calculate the pre-FST uh, disparity level which is 11.3 uh, through January 15, 2015 to uh, July 2016. So, um, however, we want to uh, like emphasize on the pre-FST like uh, uh, stages might not be directly comparable to the post-FST because uh, we do not know if uh, actually the difference from 11.3 percent to 9 percent is actually uh, should be attributed to the introduction of FST because there are different cases pre and post. They actually also have uh, like a, a policy changes around the time. So, but yeah, but uh, on the other hand, we do see that the worker actually reduced the disparity sort of back to the pre-FSD stages, but the FSD alone has a disparity like 20%. In terms, in terms of how to uh, interpret the disparity, so we still believe that disparity will indicate the uneven distribution of the potential benefits and the harms of the state interventions. So uh, like, the 20% maybe it's still alarming, although we don't have any evidence suggesting that it's actually justified or unjustified, um, and it's really a, a systematic racism or not. So what we are actually claiming that actually, yeah, the workers still are able to like reduce the disparity to like 9%, almost like 
equivalent to the pre-FST um, stages. So, but yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a long, uh, a large body of literature in, in social work uh, talking about how you sh we should interpret, the, uh, for example, disparity in screen rate. Um, and back to the yeah the, your second questions about the yeah the misalignment between uh, sorry if I uh, let me see if I can find it yeah misalignment between the prediction targets and the uh, people's like decision making like um, like. Yeah, decision making target. So, yeah, I think this is the whole area we want to explore that whether we want to have the tools just to mimic human decisions or actually the, uh, the tools should be predict something else. But we should train people to work with like these different predictions and then actually work with the different predictions in order to like actually enhance the overall decision quality. And uh, I believe it's still an open question. And uh, the things I mentioned earlier is about like, co-design is uh, like one step so we want to do to explore the space. It's basically yeah, what to design and what to predict and what is the best way we could do to complement um, yeah, uh, and to augment human abilities in these decision-making tasks. Early, um, unless you were mentioning that there was some fear about gaming the system, mm -hmm. and that was the reason that these workers weren't like mm -hmm. told how it worked. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty in contrast to the second project you were mm -hmm. talking about, where this was all about trying to help the people who right. were using the system understand what the predictions mm -hmm. were and weren't saying. Um, so kind of two-part question. What was the behavior that the people deploying the system were afraid about in terms of gaming? Like, what did they think the employees would do and why was that undesirable? And then if you feel comfortable commenting on whether you think that's a good decision to like basically prevent the people using the system from understanding how it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, this is very, very good questions. Yeah, I can also pull out the slides about the like a guessing game slide. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the agency, they basically just tell people that, oh, we want to just uh, show people how, or show our own workers, uh, our own social workers, uh, how this system works. They are maybe afraid that it will get re uh, somehow released, and then maybe even malicious, maybe people might manipulate the score, and might manipulate the, um, you know, given that it's very, um, it's influenced some very high stake decisions, and whether, yeah, they might be afraid of the the malicious people will take advantages of the, this transparency of the kind of uh, system or algorithm, and that's their concern. However, what we show is like yeah, even if you do not tell the workers, the worker will figure out. They have to figure out in order to like incorporate this FST like recommendations into that decision making. But this is also an interesting space yeah, that uh, potential interest space to explore. Could we actually, on one hand, maybe uh, yeah, protect uh, from protect us from any like a uh, malicious sort of attacks, uh, but also uh, like actually uh, help the workers actually to work with uh, these kind of algorithmic uh, recommendations. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll close it out with one last one. Um, you made a claim near the end of the talk that these approaches can create outcomes that are more aligned with the community values, um, which aspirationally is a goal I totally agree with. And I think I just want to unpack that a little bit and say like, well, whose goals are the community goals? And how would we know if they're actually more aligned? Like, when do we get to declare success here? Right, right, right. Yeah, that, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, so what we claim is like, yeah, it's the everything related to yeah, actually uh, socially relevant human behaviors is complicated. So it's actually, yeah, like I mentioned at the very beginning. So what we could do is just uh, like making some progress in terms of understanding yeah, what is actually the community like goals are. And I will argue that we should do that in the as a first step. So for the Wikipedia case, Aura's case, so what we do is 
like we first ask people, what do you think the ORS should, uh, system should achieve? And what is your important community goals? So that's uh, actually the, uh, what is the important community value? We call it value, but value is actually a generic word we use. It indicates anything that's important to the communities. And then we did this coordinative work and trying to synthesize what people have been telling us and then to come up with this like five things. We believe that, oh, these are the things that the system should achieve. And then we do the mapping to the uh, to the actual system criteria. And and eventually we uh, we want to have uh, let the community members to decide or oh, whether they feel like yeah uh, after exploring and knowing how system work they think that or oh, at least they uh, they see a acceptable trade off sort of is achieved uh, in the uh, in the system as a sort of success so um, and yeah let me see so but also I, I think what this is yeah. sort of it's just reducing to a social choice question at some level like. Mm -hmm. Who gets to make that decision about which trade-off right. actually represents the community? Right. And you know, and who has the power to make that decision, which is a really tough thing. Right, right. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's extremely tough. So uh, we trying to like sort of for all for all of these three study, sort of we uh, we post it on the like open forums on Wikipedia. Basically, anyone can comment. For the first study, everyone like can can join, and then. We show these five like uh, like values. Also, like uh, we will pr we present the five value back to the online forums, the Wikipedia, and we want to engage any people to comment on. Like, do you think these are the things you agree on? So that's one of our like attempts, trying to expand the maybe the the audience or just trying to engage as many people as possible in the discussion. But still, yeah, eventually it will be the yeah, really active people who have more say and. The and who are willing to come in, to participate in this, willing to uh, engage in the discussion, willing to like uh, vote, and eventually like uh, uh, influence the decision. Maybe that's uh, just the same for uh, any like democratic system. So, and like the people who are willing to vote actually will influence. <laughs> All right, computer science is political science. Excellent. <laughs> Let's. I'll thank our speaker. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me.